We're in uh, the book of Matthew this evening, chapter 5. And if you want an NLT, New Living Translation Bible, uh, you can just raise your hand up in the air, please. Good evening, Norris Lee and Mrs. Lee. Good to see the both of you. Vanessa, Tommy, Cruz, good to see you. Angel, good to see you. And my friend right there, good to see you too. Is baptism coming along? Huh? Okay, good, 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 good. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Matthew 5, 1 through 3. One day, as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Let's pray, please. Father, we thank you so much for your word. It is the living word of God. It is what you, it's how you feed us. You feed our souls through your word. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our teacher, being the one who enlightens the eyes of our heart. And we thank you, Father, for this opportunity this evening to hear the word of God. We ask, Lord, that your son would be glorified in each one of our lives this evening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, please be seated. Well, if you've been with us the last two weeks, you know we've been in these three verses, and Lord willing, um, we're going to finish this first beatitude this evening, and my plan moving forward uh, is to try to do one beatitude per week. I can do it if I just pay attention to what I'm doing and not get too uh, going, but uh, three things tonight. We're going to look at the setting of what took place here and then the teaching, and then finally the blessing. So first of all, the setting. You'll notice in verse 1, it says, One day, as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. So um, the question is, you know, what prompted this sermon which is, of course, the greatest sermon that Christ gave, if you will. But what prompted this particular sermon by Jesus? And, of course, the answer is right in the verse. It says, one day he saw the crowds gathering. So you have to ask yourself, well, how did the crowds start gathering? And how did that come about? Well, let me suggest to you it was because of four things that happened in the life of Jesus. And we're going to look at those four things this evening, um, among other things, but we're going to start with those four things. And there's a, a life lesson for us in these four things. First of all, there was an undertaking. And by that I mean Jesus, who had, been, who had lived in virtual obscurity in Nazareth for 30 years, serving there in the family business, was suddenly burst on the scene like a meteor. And, you know, he was born as a little child through, to a virgin, born in Bethlehem, but Elizabeth and her husband Joseph lived up in Nazareth, up in the northern part of Israel. So after his birth and so on, and after they went to Egypt because of the fear of Herod and so on, uh, they wound up back at home in a small little town that was really of no consequence to anybody in Israel. It would be the least likely place that anybody would want to move to. It was just a small little town. And so Jesus was their firstborn child, and he had about at least four brothers and I believe two sisters, if I'm not mistaken. So there were approximately seven children in the family. Being the oldest, he would have 
you know, depending on how many years were between the birth of each child, he would have, as he was growing, been able to observe his first sibling and then his second sibling and his third sibling, his fourth, fifth, sixth sibling. And then living there in the family, he was able to observe his mother Mary and his father Joseph. She, by the way, was called a handmaiden of the Lord, meaning that her heart was tender towards God. Joseph, on the other hand, was called a, a just man. He was a good man. And so he was able to observe his earthly father, if you will, and his earthly mother uh, w raise their children. He worked in the family business and observed life just like we do today. People then were no different than people are today. We're made the same way. The only thing that has changed between then and now is technology. In the book of Hebrews, it says that Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So living as a man, the oldest son, he would have suffered. Uh, remember, his siblings were not saved. So they were normal, unsaved, sinful human beings, although they lived in a pretty nice family. And not all of the customers at the Joseph uh, Carpentry shop were upstanding citizens. And, and so he would have lived life much like any person. And the Bible doesn't really tell us anything about the moment that he left Nazareth to go down to where John the Baptist was baptizing. And by the way, John the Baptist was his cousin. Did you know that? They were cousins. They knew each other. They grew up together. And the Lord had spoken to John the Baptist about the coming Messiah. He said, the one upon whom you see the Spirit of God descending, he is the Messiah. And so there was a tremendous crowd on the riverbank. Jesus was in that crowd. John may have seen him or not. The Bible doesn't tell us. Uh, he wouldn't have caught your attention as being tall, dark, and handsome. Uh, there was nothing unusual about him. But he was standing in the crowd, realizing that he was about to undertake the first step now, if you will, towards the cross. And so people were being baptized, and the next thing John knew, Jesus is coming, and this whole matter, in fact, if you'll turn with me to chapter 3 in Matthew, um, verse 16, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, it, it tells us there, after his baptism, they had a little discussion prior to, but after his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, his hair, uh, you know, wet and so on, the heavens were opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. So Jesus was now undertaking his ministry, and he lived very patiently for 30 long years. And, you know, when you think of 30 years, that's a, that is a long time, and he was patient, and uh, I, I could go on, but let me just say this. He, he was undertaking his ministry, but he had been patient, and if I can encourage you, please, to be patient as you wait upon what God has for you to undertake. Because God does not just call pastors or evangelists or whatever to ministry. Every believer is a part of the body of Christ. And all throughout the New Testament, Paul explains that as members of Christ's body, we each play a role in the body. And so you could take your, your knuckle on your index finger. It plays a role. So each of you 
have a role to play in the body of Christ. And we're going to be getting into that a lot more as we get into Ephesians chapter 4. But uh, it's important to be patient. Just, it's important to be patient. But it's also important to move when God calls you to move. On patience, one man said, we will not grow weary of waiting if we remember how long and how graciously he once waited for us. But when God wants a worker, he calls that person. Your salvation is God's business. His service is your business. So there was an undertaking, but there was also then this affirming. Imagine Jesus there in the water being baptized as we just read, and all of a sudden the heavens open and the Spirit of God descended upon him and he heard his father's voice, perhaps, only time we know in scripture, as a man, he heard the audible voice of God. And what an encouragement that was to him. In other words, Jesus was now doing what he was supposed to do to go to the cross and here the Father is affirming to him. He says, this is my dearly beloved son who brings me great joy. Imagine the Father saying that about his own son. He brings me great joy. And of course, the joy also was knowing that he would bring many sons unto salvation. So in your own life, let God affirm to you what he wants you to do. Uh, you can look for his affirming in your life. Just let it happen naturally. You can look for his affirming through the word of God. Uh, one of the reasons it's important to, in my mind, be a Bible reader. I met a man in Fresno months ago, and I said, oh, you're a Christian, huh? And he said, yeah. He said, I'm a Bible-reading, church-going Christian. And he said, I'm for real. And that means to be in the word of God. But Look in the Word of God. Let God speak to you and let wise believers help you and so on. But just as Jesus was, the, the Spirit of God came upon him as a man for the purpose of empowering him. So we can all undertake whatever God has for us. God will affirm it. Believe me, he will affirm to you what he wants you to do. But in that affirmation, to depend on the power of God. If you have the Holy Spirit empowering you, and if you have the Word of God in your hands, that's all you need to go forward in serving God. You need His power, and you need His Word. The third thing is, if you look with me in Matthew chapter 4, please, verse 1, there was a resisting that took place. In Matthew 4.1, it says, Then, after the baptism and after the affirmation, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil, by the devil himself. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said, I will give it all to you, he said if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. 
Then the devil went away, and angels came and took care of Jesus. Then he went on to choose his disciples, and he began his uh, public ministry. But as you undertake whatever it is that God has for you to do, and I know we have people here in this congregation tonight uh, who are undertaking brand new ministries in their life, uh, God is going to affirm you, but know this, you also will be attacked by the devil. And you, you can resist him. Now remember, Jesus was a human being as well as being God. So as a human being, he was saying to the world, as a man, I can resist Satan. He did it by the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. And what did he do upon every temptation that came his way? He responded with the word of God, didn't he? Now, Jesus knew the word of God. Remember, he'd been brought up in a religious environment. And again, you can see why it is important to be well-grounded in the doctrines of the Bible so that the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you can, like in a Rolodex, if you remember what that was, or I should use a more modern uh, example, I suppose, a website <laughs> or a blog or whatever, the Holy Spirit can bring to your mind a scripture. You may not know the exact address of the scripture, but you'll remember at least the sense of the scripture. So when Satan is attacking you, believe me, you need the word of God. You need the sword of the spirit to fight him. So there was a resisting. And you can resist Satan if you resist him by following the example of Jesus. Concerning temptation, it takes two to make a successful temptation, and you are one of the two. Weak doctrines will not be a match for powerful temptations. You need strong doctrinal grounding in the Word of God. You don't need, um, well... Weak doctrines will not be a, ma a, a, a match. When the, when the powers of hell, the demons of hell attack you, you're well served if you understand the doctrines of God. If you don't, you're, you're, you're really like a, a big target. And fourthly, if you look in Matthew 4, 17, there was a proclaiming. Jesus began to preach. So in verse 17, it says, from then on, Jesus began to preach. And just to remind you of why we're doing these, looking at this, is the question is, how did these crowds begin to grow? Well, look here. Jesus began to preach, and here was his first sermon. Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of God is near. And then in Matthew 4.23... Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee up in the north where he lived, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom, and he healed every kind of disease and illness. Somebody said Jesus probably had more miracles occur in one day than occurred in all of the Old Testament. In verse 24, news about him spread as far as Syria, and people soon began bringing to him all who were sick, whatever their sickness or disease, or if they were demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed them all. Large crowds followed him wherever he went. People from Galilee, the ten towns, that's the Decapolis over uh, by the Jordan, uh, Jerusalem, from all over Judea, and from the east of the Jordan River. So there was a proclaiming. So he undertook his ministry. God affirmed it. And then he wound up resisting the attack of the devil. And of course, he wants to knock you down when you start out serving him. A dear brother was sharing with me last night 
uh, that what a big step it was for him to begin getting involved in ministry. And it is a big step, and it shouldn't be taken lightly. And when you take a big step, you might think, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really doing everything I should do as a Christian. I'm, I'm Now I'm serving God. Well, Satan doesn't like that because he knows that by your service to God, God can use your life to help bring other people to Christ or to help other people in their walk with Christ. So he wants to knock you down like a bowling pin before you even get started. But if you resist him, he'll flee. And then there was this proclaiming. And God wants to proclaim the message of the gospel through your life. Like, for instance, helping with these um, shoeboxes here. Uh, the children who will receive each of these have no idea that you may have prayed that you, first of all, got this box and that you personally prayed for that box. You're proclaiming the good news. That's a very real way. But your life proclaims the good news. It ought to. Your witness ought to be a, a proclamation of the good news. Do you know the best way to revive a church? Do you know what it is? Hmm? Anybody want to take a shot at it? Start a fire in the pulpit. And people will come to watch the pastor burn. And I'm dead serious. I am dead serious. Imagine if there is no fire in the pastor's heart. Imagine if he's not hearing God. Imagine if he isn't being taught in the word of God. Imagine if he's not in fellowship with God. But imagine if he is all of those things. Then you know what? There'll be a fire in his heart. And when you come, you'll see the fire burn. And what it'll do for you, among other things, it will revive your heart. So pray for your pastor. Pray that there is a fire in the pulpit because you will directly benefit. Do you know preaching or sharing the word of God is simply God's truth through your personality. God has made you not like, we're not cookie cutter Christians. We're individually made by God and you're just exactly the way God wants you to be. And through your personality, God can get his truth going. So we can see now why these crowds were gathering. It says one day as he saw the crowds gathering and he was sensitive. He knew that these people were aware of him. They were aware that he could do what for them seemed impossible. Imagine casting a demon out of your child, healing a paralytic, and he, and he healed them all. So crowds were following him, him around. And he, he took that opportunity then to explain to people what the Christian life was really all about, which is, leads us then to number two here this evening, the teaching of the Beatitudes. You'll notice in verse three, it's, uh, verse two it says, and he began to teach them, and he said, God blesses those who are poor, we know it means humility, and realize their need for him, for theirs is the kingdom, uh, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. So please know, as a, just a bit of review, Jesus is not teaching here on how to be saved. Rather, he's describing how a saved person is to live. And he's describing the blessings that come into the life of a saved person. The word beatitude means blessedness. It means happiness. It means godly joy. By the way, what is the one thing, um, what's the name of that quarterback for the, is it the New England Patriots? What's his name? Brady. He's got like three rings already. Larry King once asked him, what do you, what do you want now in life? You know, you've got a beautiful wife and three rings. And he said, the next one, the next ring. But, but most celebrities, people of renown and wealth and all of that, what do they always say they really want? They just want to be happy, don't they? Because things, people, places, 
etc. experiences. They are, sin is joyful for a season, but it doesn't bring you fulfillment. The only thing that brings fulfillment to a poor man or a wealthy man is to be right with God. And so um, the Beatitudes mean the happiness of God, the blessings of God, godly joy. These, this joy comes from God. So the Sermon on the Mount is not a set of regulations which a person must obey in order to become a Christian, but a description of how a person is meant to live as a Christian. And nowhere does this come in more clearly than in the Beatitudes. They are not directions, but they're descriptions. So in these Beatitudes, as in the other chapters in the sermon, we will see in detail that true believers are poor in spirit, they mourn over their sins, they are meek, and they hunger after righteousness, they are merciful, they are pure in heart, and are peacemakers. Those definitions go right to the heart of life. They are indications of character, not of laws. Somebody said character is what a man is in the dark when nobody can see him. There are two aspects that God would have us to keep in balance as we look at the Beatitudes. Number one, all Christians are meant to display these characteristics. Jesus is not suggesting that these characteristics are only for Christian leaders or for those, quote, in full-time ministry, nor are these characteristic, characteristics meant for the more zealous and on-fire Christians. The Beatitudes reflect the qualities of the normal Christian life, not the abnormal, and they are meant to be seen in the life of every Christian. So all Christians are meant to display these characteristics. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. begun. Let me say this to you as a very sobering, true statement. Anybody who claims to be God's child or they claim to know God, or to belong in his kingdom, or to be a member of his body, or of his church, in, in whom these qualities are conspicuous by their absence, is a liar and does not know the truth. Let me read that again. Anybody who claims to be God's child, or to know him, or to belong to his kingdom, or to be a member of his body, the church, in whom these qualities, this person, in whom these qualities are conspicuous by their absence, is a liar and does not know the truth. So you can go through all these eight beatitudes, and if they're not in a person's life, they're not a Christian. They're not a Christian. Remember, this isn't teaching you how to be saved. This is teaching, how to, teaching you how to live as a saved person. Uh, the book of 1 John basically says the same thing. Uh, he who says, I know God, but doesn't obey, obey him, obey him, excuse me, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So, the point we're talking about here is keeping these beatitudes in balance. First of all, all Christians, so everyone here this evening who professes to be a Christian, all Christians are meant to display these characteristics. The second or the other side of the balance is all Christians are meant to display all of these characteristics. So all Christians are meant to display these, and all Christians are meant to display all of these characteristics. The Beatitudes are not like a, um, a buffet, you know, where you walk by and you can pick 
and choose this, or I'll have some lettuce, I'll have some this and that. Now, there are some characteristics which are not found, if you will, in, in all Christians. Why would that be? Well, some are extroverts, some are introverts, some are naturally adventurous, some are cautious, some are positive in their approach to problems, others tend to be negative. And nobody would seriously suggest that all these characteristics should somehow be ironed out so that all Christians become identical in temperament. It would be a weird world if it was. Nor does the Bible suggest that all Christians have the same abilities or the same spiritual gifts. But the Beatitudes are not about gifts, they're about graces. And God expects all of his people to manifest all of them. So that's a kind of an interesting little argument that I just put forward. There's eight of them. There's eight of these Beatitudes. We've been looking at the first one for two whole weeks. Poor in spirit, again, does not mean poor materially. Rather, it's speaking of humility of spirit. Humility of spirit is defined as a man knowing he is entirely dependent upon God for everything in his life. That's what Jesus was saying here. Notice, he says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. Now, how much of a need do you have for God? I mean, put it in those terms. Is it like a little bit? It's like medium. Is it a big medium? You know, two-thirds? Is it a sometimes need? We really, we need God, don't we? In every part of our life. And listen to this. Here you go. Since we need him, okay, we agree, we need him. And if we are humble... He will help us, right? And our lives are blessed. The Christian life is a blessed life because God meets the needs in your life that only he can meet. And humility is one of the requirements to be blessed by God. The Bible says, as we quoted it Sunday, speaking of uh, humility in 1 Peter chapter 5, that God resists the what? The proud or the person who thinks, well, I don't need God, but he gives grace to the humble. And then he goes on to say, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. And you know, the interesting thing is that as you begin to seek to be humble before God and, and these beatitudes begin to be part of your life, uh, you, you're growing in Christ. And um, what a blessing it is. Speaking of humility, a British pastor named G. Campbell Morgan, one of the dead guys, he said this, all God's thrones are reached by going downstairs. How about that? Hmm? You like that? Yeah. Another British pastor who actually took over Westminster Chapel from G. Campbell Morgan, just a few blocks from um, Buckingham Palace, he said, speaking on humility, he said, I sometimes think that the very essence of the Christian position and the secret of a successful spiritual life is just to realize two things. Number one, I must have complete, absolute confidence in God. And number two, have no confidence in myself. Hmm? We were just singing, how great thou art. So here are two little examples to help us define humility. When we're walking in humility, we will come to Jesus on his terms. In other words, we're, we're going low before him. We're looking to him. We'll not, we will not try to walk with Jesus Christ while keeping our pride. That doesn't work. 
or our sinful pleasures or our covetousness or our immorality. We just, it just doesn't work. We have to come to a holy God on his terms. Remember, this isn't about being saved. This is about living the Christian life. We can't modify his standards by church traditions or by our own inclinations or persuasions. His word alone is our standard. In fact, in the Lord's Prayer in chapter 6, I'll just read it to you, just two verses. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy in my life. May you be kept honored and revered and feared. And may your kingdom or your rule, your reign come in my life. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So humility is... We come to God on his terms. We don't say, well, our church teaches this, but I know it's not necessarily in the Bible. Or I think I can get a free pass on this activity because, you know, you know, I'm just, I love God. You get what I'm saying? Hello? Yeah. I thought maybe I was the only one who said those kind of things. So, but I haven't, but you have. So thank you for your honest confession tonight. <laughs> Concerning this matter of humility, one of the Puritans named Thomas Watson, he said this, a castle that has long been besieged and is ready to be taken will deliver up on any terms to save their lives. He whose heart has been a garrison for the devil and has held out long in opposition against Christ, when once God has brought him to poverty of spirit and he sees himself damned without Christ, let God propose what articles he will or circumstances. He will readily subscribe to them. In other words, you'll come to God in, on his terms. Secondly, when we are poor in spirit, we're filled with praise and we're spilled, spilled. Well, we're spilling out with thanksgiving and we're spilling out with adoration. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14 says this, Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. This is Paul. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. And you remember, of course, Paul was the one who was the lead persecutor of Christians, right? He actually helped Christians. To, he got them arrested and they wound up being martyred. And he loved it. He loved seeing these Christians being martyred. He was an insolent man. He was a violent man, we're told. But then the Lord met him on the road to Damascus and he was completely deflated and he got converted and God picked him up and used him now to pre preach the gospel. But he says, oh, how generous and how gracious the Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that come from Christ Jesus. And God has done that for you, hasn't he? Oh, how gracious and how generous God has been to you when you think about it. Hmm? I always like to think, what was the darkest thought or action I was involved in just before my conversion? Where were you just before God detonated your salvation by touching your heart and awakening you? And where would you have wound up? You know, whatever direction you're going in, guess what direction you go in? The direction you're going in, right? That's where you're going to arrive. If you're going somewhere, that's where you're going. Oh, how generous and how gracious God is because he has filled you with faith, hasn't he? And, and Paul said that faith, it comes from Jesus Christ. 
So Jesus gave you that faith. And the love you have for God and the love that's being produced in your heart, God's the one who gives us that love. So we've looked at the setting. We've looked at the teaching. And I'm so happy because I think we're going to finish this study. Aren't you? We might get finished early. I'll make some things up just to stay on time, okay? We want to look at the blessings that are promised by Jesus. Look what he says in verse 3 with me again. God, almighty God, what does he do? He blesses those who are humble. And humility is seen as realizing their need for him. Think with me for a moment again before you were converted, please. Did you not think you were okay and, you know, God is okay, he's up there, but I'm okay and he's okay and I can get along okay? Didn't you think that? Hmm? And then all of a sudden, what happened? God began to work in your life and he turned your life upside down. You were like inside of a, a washing machine. And you finally cried out to him, you realized I need Jesus Christ in my life or I'm going straight to hell. And he, he wants to be in my life. And that humility that was part of your salvation, it's the same realization today. God wants to bless those who realize their need for him. So again, getting back to what I was saying earlier, uh, it's, it's so interesting. Many times young believers will say, and I've had somebody even say this. I better hurry. Huh? Thank you, Ken. Uh, I've got to be careful when I go off script. But uh, I had a, a brother here in this sanctuary tonight one time say, I, I wonder if it's okay for me to pray about this. And he thought maybe he was being selfish. It is okay for you to pray about whatever's on your mind. Whatever it is, whether it's a little thing or whether it's a big thing. And how needy are we? So he blesses those who realize their need for him. It says, for theirs, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Well, what exactly does that mean? Well, let me give you four quick answers to what that means. First of all, the word theirs is emphatic. It means only these people, only the humble people, and none other. It's barring all others who might try to enter in some other way. Those who are not poor in spirit will not only not enter the kingdom, but they won't receive much blessing from God. The text says, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs now. So you possess the kingdom of heaven now. It means that you are no longer under the power of Satan and his kingdom, but you have a new king. Turn to Colossians, please, with me. Chapter 1, verse 13. Chapter 1, verse 13. Look what God has done for you. The scriptures are so wonderful. You know when we slow down enough to read them? Pastor Mike was telling me he was reading something the other day, and, you know, he planned to read this, you know, this whole section of something, and he had to just stop because God was speaking to him about that. And it, it's amazing when we just stop and look at something like in Colossians 1.13. It says, for he has rescued us, Think of these firemen rescuing these people. He has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. So he's done two things. He's rescued you, and then he's transferred you into the new kingdom. You've been removed from one kingdom, and you're now being, you're reestablished in a new kingdom. And here are some of the blessings 
for those who are in the kingdom of God. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, please, in verse 9. You know, when you start talking about what kind of blessings could God bring into a person's life, you could, uh, we could sit around here and have, a, we wouldn't even come close to even putting a list together. But it was interesting to me to think of the Lord's Prayer because there's a number of blessings that are found in the Lord's Prayer. Remember, he taught the disciples how to pray. And let me say this, I believe in our own church, many, I would say the majority of people who come to, uh, have come to Calvary Chapel have had a Catholic background and repeated this prayer over and over, you know, unknowingly. And then in our own church, we've kind of almost dismissed the power of this prayer. But when you can compare this prayer with what Jesus prayed in John 17, when he prayed to his father, you see direct parallels between the two. It's, he said, this is how to pray. I mean, we all say, I don't know how to pray. Well, this is how to pray. And here are the blessings. You can rejoice, first of all, in the direct access we have. Our Father in heaven. We, we rejoice. We have a heavenly Father. You can reflect on all that he is to you. It says, hallowed be, hallowed be your name. And of course, the names of God, El Shaddai, Powerful One, Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, and so on and so forth. You can reflect on all that he is to you. Thirdly, you can look at the rule and the reign in your life of Jesus Christ. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You as a believer can ask Jesus Christ, I want you, Lord, to rule in my life today. I want you to reign in my life. May your will be done in my life. Can you think of a greater blessing than to have the will of God brought into your life? The will from the only one who's perfect in knowing and justice and love and mercy and faithfulness and power and in love? There's not, a, there's, not a, there's not a scratch of darkness in God. Lord, rule in my life. And think of how your father must feel when you say that to him. And by the way, you know, ruling in your life, well, look, we'll go on. I'll just stop here because I want to finish here. But also we can look at the resources from heaven that God gives us day by day. In Matthew 6, 12, give us today the food we need. We've all eaten today. We all have clothes on. We, we're in a nice building. We all have a roof over our head tonight the resources from heaven, and then also receiving forgiveness of our sins and forgive us our sins. And here's one thing to say that connects with the rule of Christ. If you're, you know, when a Christian is, becomes enslaved to sin, as Paul speaks about in Romans 6 and 7, you can ask the Lord to rid you of that sin. Ask him to help you. He's not going to say, well, you know, you've been a bad boy. I've, you know, you've come to me with this five times already. Shame on you. I mean, we might have said that to somebody. Don't talk to me about that. You know what to do. He's not going to say that. He, he comes to the person who is contrite and broken. And sin destroys our lives, doesn't it? Also, there's the blessing of releasing others as we forgive them. We can become enslaved by keeping hatred and bitterness in our hearts towards people who on a, a purely human level, they deserve it and more. They've wronged you but we can release them. What a blessing. And then we can resist the devil. It says, deliver us from evil or from the evil one. 
And of course, uh, being in the kingdom of heaven, having the kingdom of heaven as ours, also includes two more future blessings beyond the multitude of blessings in this life. We will reign and rule with Christ for 1,000 years on the earth, and we will enjoy being in New Jerusalem, the holy city, or heaven where God dwells. So we have a fabulous future ahead of us, and we have so many blessings as we are poor in spirit and realize our need for God. The Bible says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Somebody said, in giving up their own kingdom, the poor in spirit inherit God's. Pastor Tony Evans, whom I love so much, he said, when my first grandson was being born, he had a little difficulty coming into this world. The doctor remarked that the head was in the wrong position. The easiest way to be born is to have your head facing down. Because my grandson was not facing down, his delivery process was an extended one. Even his mother experienced pain because of this. It's better if the head is turned up when the delivery is taking place. If the head is turned up, or turned, uh, if the head is turned up, you face less pain. When my first grandson was being born, that he had difficulty coming into the world, and the doctor remarked, uh, you know, that his head was in the wrong position, as we've said here. Looks like I've doubled up, I'm, I'm saying the same thing twice. Well, let me, let me say it three times, uh, one for each member of the Trinity. It never hurts to triple check your notes, doesn't it? That's why I'm going to keep you here for way beyond eight o'clock. But listen, it was a pretty good illustration. Let me give you the punchline to this illustration. Isn't it nice that we can laugh? Huh? It is. We can laugh and be as dead serious as we can be. Can you think of anything more serious than being humble before God? Seriously. Hmm? So why are you all laughing? <laughs> so if you're born with your head looking down, you have extended pain, right? You mothers would know that, right? A lot of us have extended pain because our head is turned in the wrong direction. They are turned up. It's in the wrong position. We haven't turned our head down and humbled ourselves under the mighty hand of God so he can exalt us. Isn't that a nice illustration? Hmm? And thank you, Jesus. I finished one minute over time here tonight. You know, it doesn't matter if we don't finish your sermon, but I think three nights under, for one beatitude is plenty, don't you? Amen. Hmm? Are you sure? Because I could dig deeper on that one. No, no. <laughs> no, no, don't give me the deep fried chicken. I want to, just what you got here, cooked easy. Who's, who's uh, doing announcements tonight? Pastor Mike. Could I pray as he's coming on up here, please? Thank you all very much for your attention to the Word of God tonight, and I, I do pray that God has taught us something here that we can really keep in our minds. Father, I pray that when we awaken tomorrow, we'll remember Pastor Evans' illustration. Having our head turned up can cause a lot of trouble. If our heads are down in humility before you, you can bless our lives. So please help us, Lord, to have this beautiful beatitude growing in each one of our lives. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Amen.